True religion in great part consists in holy affections. We see that the apostle in remarking the operations and exercises of religion in these Christians, when it had its greatest trial by persecution, as gold is tried in the fire, and when it not only proved true, but was most pure from dross and mixtures, and when it appeared in them most in the genuine excellency and native beauty, and was found to praise and honor and glory, he singles out the religious affections of love and joy as those exercises in which their religion did thus appear true, pure, and glorious. Here it may be inquired, what the affections of the mind are, I answer, the affections of no other than the more vigorous and sensible exercises of the inclination and will of the soul. God has endued the soul with two principal faculties. The one, that by which it is capable of perception and speculation, or by which it discerns and judges of things, which is called the understanding. The other, that by which the soul is some way inclined with respect to the things it views or considers. Or it is a faculty by which the soul beholds things, not as an indifferent, unaffected spectator, but either as liking or disliking, pleased or displeased, approving or rejecting. This faculty is called by various names. Sometimes it is called the inclination. And by its respects, the actions determined and governed by it is called the will. And the mind, with regard to the exercises of this faculty, is often called the heart. The exercises of this last faculty are of two sorts. Either those by which the soul is carried out towards the things in view and approving them, being displeased with and inclined to them, or those in which the soul opposes the things in view and disproving them and in being displeased with, averse from, and rejecting them. And as the exercises of the inclinations are various in their kind, so they are much more various in their degrees. There are some exercises of pleasedness or displeasedness, inclination or disinclination, in which the soul is carried but a little beyond a state of perfect indifference. And there are other degrees in which the approval or dislike, pleasedness or aversion to, are stronger, in which we may rise higher and higher until the soul comes to act vigorously and sensibly, and its actings are with that strength, that through the laws of union which the Creator has fixed between soul and body, the motion of the blood and animal spirits begins to be sensibly altered, whence oftentimes arises some bodily sensation, especially about the heart and vitals, which are the fountain of the fluids of the body. And so it comes to pass that the mind, with regard to the exercises of this faculty, perhaps in all nations and ages, is called the heart. And it is to be noted that they are these more vigorous and sensible exercises of this facility, which are called the affections, the will. And the affections of the soul are not two faculties. The affections are not essentially distinct from the will, nor do they differ from the mere actings of the will and inclination, but only in the liveliness and sensibility of exercise. It must be confessed that language is here somewhat imperfect, the meaning of words in a considerable measure loose and unfixed, and not precisely limited by custom which governs the use of language. In some sense, the affection of the soul differs nothing at all from the will and inclination, and the will never is in any exercise further than it is affected. It is not moved out of a state of perfect indifference any otherwise than as it is affected one way or another. But yet, there are many actings of the will and inclination that are not so commonly called affections. In everything we do in which we act voluntarily, there is an exercise of the will and an inclination. It is our inclination that governs us and our actions. But all the actings of the inclination and will are not ordinarily called affections. Yet what are commonly called affections are not essentially different from them, but only in the degree and manner of exercise. In every act of the will whatsoever the soul either likes or dislikes is either inclined or disinclined to what is in view. These are not essentially different from the affections of love and hatred. A liking or inclination of the soul to a thing, if it be in a high degree vigorous and lively, is a very same thing with the affection of love, and a disliking and disinclining, if in a great degree, is the very same with hatred. In every act of the will, for or towards something not present, the soul is in some degree inclined to that thing. 
and that inclination, if in a considerable degree, is the very same with the affection of desire. And in every degree of an act of the will in which the soul approves of something present, there is a degree of pleasedness. And that pleasedness, if it be in a considerable degree, is the very same with the affection of joy or delight. And if the will disapproves of what is present, the soul is in some degree displeased. And if that displeasedness be great, it's the very same thing with the affection of grief or sorrow. Such seems to be our nature, and such the laws of the union of soul and body, that there never is in any case whatsoever any lively and vigorous exercise of the inclination without some effect upon the body and some alteration of the motion of its fluids and especially of the animal spirits. And on the other hand, from the same laws of union, over the constitution of the body and the motion of its fluids, may promote the exercise of the affections. But yet, it is not the body but the mind only that is the proper seat of the affections. The body of man is no more capable of being really the subject of love or hatred, joy or sorrow, fear or hope, than the body of a tree, or than the same body of man is capable of thinking and understanding. As it is a soul only that has ideas, so it is a soul only that is pleased or displeased with its ideas. As it is a soul only that thinks, so it is a soul only that loves or hates, rejoices, or is grieved at what it thinks of. Nor are these motions of the animal spirits and fluids of the body anything properly belonging to the nature of the affections, though they always accompany them in the present state but are only effects or concomitants of the affections, which are entirely distinct from the affections themselves, in no way essential to them, so that an unbody spirit may be as capable of love and hatred, joy or sorrow, hope or fear, or other affections as one that is united to a body. The affections and passions are frequently spoken of as the same. And yet, in a more common use of speech, there is in some respect a difference. Affection is a word that, in its ordinary signification, seems to be something more extensive than passion, being used for all vigorous, lively actings of the will or inclination. But passion is used for those that are more sudden, and whose effects on the animal spirits are more violent, the mind being more overpowered and less than its own command. As all the exercises of inclination and will are concerned, either in approving and liking or disapproving and rejecting, so the affections are of two sorts. They are those by which the soul is carried out to what is in view, cleaving to it, or seeking it, or those by which it is averse from it, and opposes it. Of the former sort are love, desire, hope, joy, gratitude, and complacence. Of the latter kind are hatred, fear, anger, grief, and such like, which it is needless now to stand particularly to define. And there are some affections in which there is a composition of each of the aforementioned kinds of actings of the will. As in the affection of pity, there is something of the former kind towards a person suffering, and something of the better towards what he suffers. And so in zeal there is in it high approbation of some person or thing, together with vigorous opposition to what is conceived to be contrary to it. 